Okay, everybody. Hi. I'm um, so sorry about what happened on um, on Friday. It was just a uh, furiously frustrating uh, thing. I I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, it. Uh, but anyway, it's um, it's functioning now. It's um, 1:48 uh, Saturday Sunday morning. Uh, so I thought I'd go ahead while it is functioning and narrate. Um, at least part of the um, discussion we were going to have on Friday, and that's the kind of uh, background stuff. I didn't give you reading on that. I want you, I you know, I gave you stuff to just kind of dive into with Nate Silver, and I hope you enjoyed that. Um, he's really an interesting person. Um, what I was going to do is what I'm going to do now, which was um, spend the first half of the class uh, giving a lecture on matters uh kind of meta matters um related to um questions of uh, interdisciplinarity the um, kind of uh epistemological maybe methodological um rewards and challenges of um doing what we refer to as uh inter interdisciplinary work now the term also gets used quite often transdisciplinary as well as multidisciplinary, and I'm, I actually appreciate the distinctions between those, but we're not going to, uh, at least not today, make make them. Um, uh, the basic distinction we're going to make is is between disciplined based work um, uh, and uh, that which transgresses those disciplinary boundaries into something larger. Um, I would just say at the offset that. If you're familiar with the concept of an emergent property, uh, something that um, you know emerges from the uh, admixture of multiple things and becomes larger than the sum of its parts, um, we can kind of think of interdisciplinarity uh, or interdisciplinary research and teaching um, as having uh, as a result um, that very thing. Uh, it, it the the um, uh, analytical power of uh, or the explanatory leverage of uh, interdisciplinary uh, work um, it seems to be in, in some important ways um, uh, larger, more um, um, powerful than uh, the uh, additive effect of the individual disciplines and so um, so yeah, so I, I'm I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to also kind of um, preface this by, um, as I tend to do, um, kind of just from reflecting on on my career, how I became uh, a deeply committed interdisciplinarian, um, despite its uh, despite its risks, uh, and there are some, and we're going to talk about that. Um, uh, uh, the challenges are are real, um, professional and intellectual. Uh, but the payoffs uh, tend to be, as you'll see, um, quite significant. Uh, and we're going to talk about what drives, why is interdisciplinarity such a, such a growing, s yet still contested and controversial um, development. So, so here we go. Interdisciplinary inquiry uh, as a functional response to wicked social problem. Remember, the, the idea of wicked problem um, is, uh, for our purposes, um, really just a, a social problem, and hopefully after last week, a social problem has a very specific uh, meaning to you. It's, it's that thing, that, that problem, th this, this condition um, that may well have been with us for time immemorial, but um, at some point, a number of people, enough, a critical mass of people decided that that, that problematic situation was unacceptably problematic, and it uh, became something that they were committed to ending and and then you kind of kick off that whole process of claims making and and uh, and it becomes recognized as a social problem and I took you through my uh, m my inquiry into why um, mass atrocity crimes uh, became recognized in international society as as um, the most important uh, international social problem um over uh one might argue um at least two equally compelling 
social problems, uh, if not in just in kind of rationality, cost benefit terms, um, problems that are more severe and more significant on an, on an annual basis, uh, uh, underdevelopment, poverty, and and infectious disease. Um, so okay, so here we go. Um, this word cloud here. Uh, you know, kind of has research, impact, disciplines, communication. Uh, there's a publishing house mentioned there, Paul Grave. Um, uh, we'll make sense of. Sense okay, so I'm um, sorry, a little glitch there. Um, what do we have uh, when we uh, talk about interdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary research and teaching? <coughs> pardon me. Is really nothing less than a fundamental revisioning of the, in some sense, quite literal um, architecture of the modern university as it's been um, bequeathed to us from, from earlier eras, uh, you know, the, the 2000, the thousand year history of the university. Um, and, you know, and I say quite literally, uh, the transformation of the architecture of the university. Um, if you look at that picture in the upper left, it's um, the term faculty uh, in the American context tends to confuse people um, because we refer to, you know, people like me and, um, you know, uh, Dr. Houston as, as faculty members. But um, in the more European context and elsewhere, um, faculty tends to refer to um, what in an you know, American institution like, like Webster, uh, departments or schools, you know, colleges, College of Arts and Sciences. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, so, so that's what those faculties uh, in that picture mean. And, no, and, and notice the shape of them, right? Uh, and notice, um, and they don't have any, you know, uh, um, descriptive names to them. It's a, but, but, but the point is, is that you've got these separate faculties, right, that constitute, you know, and they collectively make up the university. Right? Um, when I say quite literally transform the architecture, um, what I'm going to say is, is that, um, you know, the buildings on university campuses today, traditionally even, um, house discrete disciplines. So, you know, you, uh, where I went to graduate school in Woodburn Hall um, is, the, is where the political science department is um, located, as well as the um, African Studies program. <coughs> um, Harrison Hall was the um, history department and um, you know the Kelly School of Business was in its own very large building um, so um, you know wh how else would you do it you might think you know what um, and and that kind of question is exactly why there are um, opponents to interdisciplinarity as I'll, as I'll point out um, but the problem or at least one of the problems um, is that we can refer to these um, faculties, these uh, um, discrete discipline-based um, structures, either physical structures or you know, um, intellectual structures, as silos. Um, I don't know if silo is a globally recognized term, but in, in, a, in the American farming context, silos are these um, you know, tall, standalone, cylindrical structures that hold usually grain or whatever. Um, and, um, you know, they're, in, they're, they're protective structures. You know, you can store grain for a very long time and keep it, you know, keep the grain um, safe from uh, the external um, uh, in, you know, weather and stuff, right? So um, the point here being, right, is academia a bunch of silos? Me, the question they're asking is, um, is there an unhelpful um, silence, uh, lack of conversation um, between the silos? Um, if, uh, if, you know, on the left picture we've got just, if we replace those nameless faculties with you know, economics and history and communication and art and art history and what have you, um, is there 
an absence or an inadequate degree of um, um, correspondence between those silos. Um, and, the, and the interdisciplinarians among us um, think yes, right? Um, the uh, disciplinarians, those who defend the, the kind of traditional um, structure, both intellectual and, and literal, um, have some arguments to, to, to be, you know, to make that are not, you know, um, crazy. Uh, but for someone like me who is, you know, quite deeply committed to interdisciplinary teaching and research, um, I think the reasons why uh, interdisciplinarity is such a growing phenomenon and is radically transforming the university and has been for five or six decades now, it's really kind of picking up exponentially. Um, the reason that's happening, um, tell us um, something about its importance and, it, and it's the best response to the defenders of, uh, of disciplines um, when those defenders are, are going beyond a kind of uh, rational reasoned defense of, of discipline and more into a kind of turf battle protectionism which is uh, just never helpful. <coughs> So um, I thought I'd start with, um, well, I'm just going to let, um, this is the beginning of my story about how um, my route from, you know, I did an undergraduate degree in political science, I did a master's degree in political science, I did a PhD in political science. Uh, with the, at the PhD level, I, I did a certification in African studies. Ah, well, wait. <laughs> And I, Pol Pot killed 1.7 million people. We can't even deal with that. I think, you know, we think if, if somebody kills someone, that's murder, you go to prison. You kill 10 people, you go to Texas, they hit you with a brick, that's what they do. <laughs> 20 people, you go to a hospital, they look through a small window at you forever. And over that, we can't deal with it, you know? Somebody's killed 100,000 people. We're almost going, well done, well done. <laughs> you killed 100,000 people? You must get up very early in the morning. <laughs> I can't even get down the gym. Your diary must look odd. Get up in the morning, death, 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 lunch. Death, 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 afternoon tea. Death, 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 quick shower. Yeah. Um, you can't imagine how often I've been asked basically this question. Uh, you know, why did you choose such a dark? Uh, I, I, I was asked this question uh, when I gave my very first talk here at this campus. Um, you know, why, um, why genocide? Why mass atrocity crimes? Why, why such horrific things? And I, I've, I think I was, uh, you guys, I was talking about, um, you know, when I first started dating here in Thailand again after my divorce, I, m the first date went so terribly badly. Um, because of my work, uh, it, I think I told you she didn't. My date found it um, disappointing. I think that um, I, I tend to watch a lot of cartoons. She, I think she found that inadequately professorial. And my response, uh, more than just a tad annoyed, um, was, you know, you can't. Do you want to know what I think about all day? And, and basically, what Eddie Izzard says, you know. 15, 16 hours a day, death, death, death. So when I get home, I, I want to kind of escape that stuff, but she didn't, she didn't find that. So um, why is the question that, I mean, and, and that's a question that, that people have, you know, with real concern for me have asked. I mean, so it's not, not really usually a, a humorous thing. It's usually asked in a, in a context of, of um, you know, like self-care and, and uh, things like that. So. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd share with you um, something I was inspired um, to uh, explore by a, 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 a dear friend and, and, a, and a mentor and one of the world's um, absolute leading authorities on the Holocaust, Dr. John Roth. Um, and one of his recent books, um, he opens the, pr the, the, the prologue with an epigraph to, um, to a poem by William Stafford that was written shortly before Stafford died called The Way It Is, and it refers throughout to a thread, right? There's a thread you follow, right? 
Um, and the poem begins, so there's a thread you follow, and it goes on a little bit. It says, and people, you know, wonder about what you are pursuing. And I, you may already have this, you know, in your life, right? Your family, or what are you studying? What's going, you know, what are you, what are you interested in? What are you, right? <coughs> um, people wonder about what you're doing, where you're headed, what you're, what you're into. Um, and, um, so he said, it's very clear, you, you have to explain uh, to people, it's important um, about, uh, you know, to people to explain about your thread, right? Uh, and this was, I should point out, the poem was written shortly before Stafford passed away, actually. Um, kind of an end of the life, I think, uh, reflection. Um, and um, so my uh, path to interdisciplinarity, my thread that I follow, is um, to be explained, uh, as um, I've been called to do. Um, so how did I become, you know, uh, after having been such a grounded political scientist, um, someone who really found um, all that grounding, all those years of education uh, and training in political science, its methodologies, you know, I can still do the... Um, multiple regression uh, statistical models by, by hand using matrix algebra. I can code the um, statistical package for social science program, which is as helpful as speaking Aramaic, because of course uh, it's you know, all done point and click now. Um, how did I get from a political scientist to someone who um, finds that the most important contributions to uh, issues that I'm concerned with uh, come from psychology uh, and um, uh, multiple um, right disciplines, history and economics. And um, although I'll be critical of all of them, as you'll, as you'll see, I'll, I'll, I'll both celebrate and pick on economics today. <coughs> um, so, what is my path? Right, where did it start? Well, some of you know, some of you don't. My my dissertation. Um, um, and, and therefore, you know, the kind of grounding of my career, the early work, uh, was, on, was in West Africa. Um, it was on conflict, actually. But conflict wasn't chosen, uh, I didn't go into it as a, as a conflict dissertation. I went into it as actually as a, uh, questions of governing and governance. Um, and I just chose conflict management as, as the kind of um, dependent or outcome variable. I was interested in um, the ways in which um, varying, changing conditions, political and economic conditions, um, democratization, capitalization, liberalization of the economy, impacted um, uh, the countries and particularly their local local communities' ability to to carry on with the business of governance. And I chose to define governance in a in a single way, um, so as I did a you know cross the cross comparisons. Uh, I chose conflict and and as a particular species of conflict, I chose that which is quite common among um, pastoralist and agriculturalist communities or herding and farming communities. And there are reasons why they are in conflict, but, but they're not always in conflict. In fact, they spend much of their time in a very symbiotic relationship. And so that was precisely why it was interesting to me is, um, you know, what accounts for it uh, being in, in a good place at times and what uh, explains why that relationship goes south and becomes um, conflictual and even violent, and and it and it was for the most part, um, you know, kind of focus on low intensity, low scale conflict. But the event that you know in in, in Senegalese history um, that that caught my attention was a 1989 um, near war uh, between the two countries that was sparked by a very small, low scale, low intensity conflict in the upper Senegal River Valley on a small island that uh, sits out in the middle of the river uh, between, herding, uh, and, uh, between herders and farmers. And several Senegalese farmers were, were killed in a, um, in, a, in a conflict that broke out between uh, Senegalese farmers on that island and Mauritanian herders that had brought their cattle, as that kind of top picture shows. They brought their cattle in and let it graze on the, on the precious crops. So, um, you know, how did I go from that scope and scale of, of uh, conflict interest, um, what, which I described just you know, in terms of the actual work as a very pleasant um, 
you know, hanging out with herders and farmers. How did I go from, and why did I go from, you know, um, hanging out with herders and farmers, right, um, to um, that which occupies my time today? It's just quite different. quite a trajectory, if you think about it, right? Um, although I was aware at the time that I was doing my dissertation that though I was, um, you know, not in a, conf in a war zone, um, as I would become later, um, I knew that herding and farming communities and the conflicts between them had the potential to to rise to very, very significant levels, as we already know or have talked about in, um, uh, say, northern Nigeria, but, but Darfur and Rwanda even, uh, I understood then um, to be um, in, in some fundamental form herder-farmer conflicts. How did I get from hanging out quite pleasantly uh, in the grasslands and savannah of, of Senegal to to Darfur. Um, well, kind of back to um, uh, the, the, the poem about the thread. Um, my friend John Roth um, takes up the poem in, his, in the opening of his book, and he, he's talking about it, and he says, um, the author, the, the poet says, it is also imperative, you know, remember the, the, the poet said, you must tell people about your thread. Um, it's important to explain your thread. Um, and, and John speaks here, he says, it is also imperative, he insisted, uh, not to abandon the thread. Um, stick with it, mm -hmm. especially when catastrophes strike and lives are maimed and lost. And that's important to me uh, for a number of reasons. But um, my thread, and the thread that John has followed for even much, much longer, um, is a dark one and uh, takes us through, um, you know, engagements and encounters with very much the darker angels of our nature. Uh, and it can be um, harmful, it can be painful. Um, John is, is quoting um, the poet here at, at a critical point in the poem for, for someone like John. Um, to not give up, uh, because I think anyone that studies these things, and, and the reason I've chosen to begin this way is the problems that we address in this class were partly chosen because they're things of great interest to me, conflict development and climate change, um, but they are also, um, the well, certainly war has long been known to be like the scourge of mankind. Um, poverty, indeed. But when we add climate change to the mix, we, we start to think about, or I have in the last several years, think about the, the bequest that my generation has left for you. And it's a, it's a massively unfair one. And um, so I, I, I start this way because in some sense I'll, I'm going to tell you how I made this choice, um, you really won't have one, um, many of you. Uh, the, the problems that we address, particularly perhaps climate change and its relationship to conflicts and poverty, that, and I've chosen them because they are all three interrelated in, in a complex system, um, is the sort of complex, wicked social problem that you're not going to have the luxury to ignore, to, to choose not to engage with. Um, and so, you know, when I ask what will be your thread, what will you be called to explain? Um, I suspect for many of you, if not all of you, at some level, in some way, at some part, your thread will take you through some of these territories too. So, 
So how did I get to, you know, be a student of, of uh, high intensity conflict and the mass atrocities to which they tend to give rise? <coughs> well, you know, there's one possible explanation that the, um, you know, the kind of world was changing. Uh, the nature of conflict itself was changing. We know that civil war has replaced, for the most part, um, interstate war. Uh, um, Bush's war on, on Iraq was not just, um, uh, you know, historic, uh, it was not just interna internationally unlawful and, and, and criminal, um, it was um, anachronistic. It was just a thing out of time, right? Uh, for the most part, um, uh, followed, of course, um, by Putin and his anachronistic um, interstate wars, Crimea and, and Ukraine. Um, but it wasn't data like that. It wasn't actually, you know, the kind of um, uh, unavoidable, uh, you know, intellectual development. That, that's not really what caught my attention. Um, because, uh, you know, this picture of me just kind of captures what I say, you know, a kind of pleasant hanging out with herders and farmers. That's, that's me at the prefecture uh, of Bakel on the, uh, very near where that um, incident took place in 1989 that almost led, led to war. Um, I'm pretty happy there. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, bullets aren't flying. I'm not the least bit, you know, worried. Um, I may be hot, but um, so this was the Africa that I knew, and and frankly, you know, I didn't really want to know. I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't called to. Uh, at least I didn't know at the time um, to investigate. Um, you know, those those horrific uh, scenes that I just I just showed you. Um, no, th it wasn't the data that got my attention and, and turned my direction towards um, what I do. It was, it was the, the thing from which I could not turn away. Um, and it began with Liberia's um, descent into, into hellish war, uh, where, you know, it became the poster child for child soldiers and um, and it was so unbelievably, um, horrifically violent and, and brutal, um, that I just, uh, it was just so hard to, um, engage with intellectually and, and try to understand. And, and, um, uh, it was... Uh, exported um, the war that it, as bad as Liberia was, um, the president of Liberia, the rebel com president of Liberia, then exports that war to the neighboring Sierra Leone as revenge against the government of Sierra Leone for opposing what he had done in Liberia. And so you end up with an even more horrific um, conflict in Sierra Leone uh, waged by the rebel group, the rebel, uh, the Revolutionary United Front. Um, and, and, and then I, you know, was like so many others kind of forced to try to explain, um, that rebel group's choice to use, you know, terroristic violence, um, against the very civilians it claimed, uh, it was fighting to liberate. Um, this is the group, folks, that hacked off upwards of 30,000 people's uh, arms and hands and feet. Um, children, as you can see here, but uh, old men, old women, no one escaped. Um, no one was, um, you know, inappropriate target for, for the RUF. The thing that struck me that made it so horrific, not was beyond the humanitarian ways in which it was horrific, was the way in which it just seemed that Everything the RUF did was so counterintuitive and counterproductive for a group that presumably was trying to win a civil war, right? It had this very elaborate charter and manifesto, uh, Why We Fight, it was called. And, and it was, you know, just this um, well-argued and, and factually correct. I mean, the regime that they did indeed uh, eventually overthrow was a long-standing, terribly corrupt, one-party, nepotistic, um, basically almost, uh, well, Liberia was more this way, 
uh, almost an apartheid state uh, in Liberia. Um, just not white and black, it was you know, the kind of uh, resettled colonists from the New World back into Africa versus the uh, people that were indigenous to Liberia. So, uh, you know, how do you explain why there, um, how do you explain a conflict, right? When everything that the major warring party does seems to lessen the likelihood that, that they will win, right? Um, it turns out that that was exactly the right question to be asking, and it was right to be puzzled by it. It was right that I had no obvious, easy answers, because as um, some like uh, Mary Caldor and others have said, it turns out that th the very nature of organized armed violence is changing at this point in a pretty dramatic way, and you can't really hope to make sense of what I'm pointing out here is what needs to be made sense of. The, the, the horrific um, brutality, uh, the, just the man's inhumanity to man. Um, uh, how do you make sense of that? Well, you can't if you don't appreciate that the whole construct of armed conflict is changing at the time in a way that can help us understand not, not a explain away or, or defend in any way, but understand uh, how this can happen. <coughs> because I just, you know, for the longest time um, was just um, unable uh, to get my head around any of that, right? Um, these couldn't be, you know, the, the child soldiers who were um, butchering uh, family members and, um, you know, raping and, and pillaging, you know, young, young, young girls and old women. And um, y these just couldn't possibly be the, the same West African kids that I've been, you know, playing soccer with, you know, right next door. And I just, it, it, I, I couldn't get my head around it, right? Um, but something was happening, right? Um, I decided at some point that I, if you know, if I'm going to be a, you know, a serious student of African affairs, uh, then you know, I I really did have to be willing to um, start to learn about uh, what was going on in, in the other um, easy, uh, less easy, um, more difficult places to hang out um, than Senegal, um, and and I would point out that my my students had a very um, critical role to play in this development. Um, when I first started teaching uh, after graduate school, um, most of my uh, African courses were, um, you know, focused on the development problem, the underdevelopment poverty and stuff like that. But my students just kept asking more and more questions about stuff that wasn't on the syllabus, basically, or was in only a small way. They, they were really wanting to know about why the why Rwanda, why Darf Darfur kind of blew up uh, in the first couple of years of my teaching career, and um, you know why were these things happening? They're so awful, and you know why? And and you know I, I just had to concede to myself and and with them. Um, you know, I, I don't have the kind of answers that you seek, I don't think. And, um, and at some point I was just unsatisfied with that. I, I, I couldn't just, just accept that. I couldn't answer the questions that were most on my students' minds. So um, I set out to um, uh, find some better answers than, than what I had. And I will say here that I quickly learned where I wasn't likely to find good answers, and um, and and that was in kind of um, common uh, common understanding, common wisdom, um, public uh, popular discourse about Africa is rarely has never um, been all that helpful. In fact, most often quite seriously harmful to Africa. Um, we might have time to talk about that in another context. Um, I'm just pointing out that this, um, what you see here, the coming anarchy, is um, a, an image of a journal article, not an academic journal, but like I think it was published in the Atlantic. Um, looks like the Atlantic. Um, 
uh, by a guy named Robert Kaplan. Um, and this article became a book by the same title. Um, and it's the worst piece of crap um, uh, I could ever assign you. Uh, if you want to learn nothing about Africa other than just um, a litany of the basest, um, most vacuous stereotypes that anybody um, who's never been to Africa could compile into an article form. Uh, that's what you get from, from Robert Kaplan. And methodologically, um, you know, basically his method to to um, support an argument he was making, which was that what was happening in Sierra Leone and, and Liberia was really a harbinger of, of uh, the world to come. Um, uh, and, you know, to, to kind of justify or, or, or um, base his such an argument on his, his methodology, his research methodology, quote unquote, um, was basically, I, I describe it, if you tend to read it, you, I think you'd agree, um, he basically flies into the city capital of Cote d'Ivoire, um, it's not actually the capital, but he flies into Abidjan, and he hangs out for a couple days. Um, he may take a Land Rover up to um, you know, the country's second city, Boaké or something, and um, but, you know, mainly he kind of hangs out in the capital city, uh, talks to some people, maybe talks to some officials, and you know, tries to get a picture of some people, the common man on the street, and then he gets in a plane and he flies off to the next capital and he does the same thing. Um, and on that kind of empty, you know, paper thin, uh, delving into the issues and complex realities that uh, is any place in the world, but certainly in Africa, uh, that must be grappled with the many complex and interacting uh, factors that give rise to the horrific violence and the uh, brutality that we saw, that can be characterized Liberians here in the end. Um, he just had you know, no, no interest whatsoever in that sort of thing. So it, his, his argument, his theory, if you, if you will, um, quickly became known as the new barbarism thesis. Um, that was a coin, that was a term coined by African scholars who found um, uh, Kaplan's work so um, depressingly familiar. You know, this basically a two, three hundred year history of that kind of writing about Africa. That this is just what you expect. They're, they're Africans, of course they're being barbaric, right? They didn't find, I certainly didn't find, that to be all that compelling of an explanation. Others did, however. Um, Bill Clinton, President Clinton at the time, was so impressed by Kaplan's work that he required uh, this work as, as mandatory reading for his entire National Security Council. Uh, everybody in the National Security Council staff had to read uh, Kaplan's by then book, okay? despite the fact that it's just absolute garbage. Okay? Um, so uh, what do we do with that, right? If, if we've got these things we want to grapple with, if we've got these problems that are so seemingly uh, um, hard to understand um, and are really important to understand. I mean, the human costs, the humanitarian costs of those conflicts are just staggering. You know, it's like, you know, it really is death, 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 death all day long um, for years on end. Um, so the problems are really important, but they're really complex, and they defy, uh, certainly they, they defy simple-minded uh, explanations like, like uh, you know, Kaplan offered. Um, but I would just kind of ask us at this juncture just to kind of think outside right for a second and say, you know, think about climate change that we're going to address, right, or global poverty, underdevelopment, right, or war, right? Um, which discipline of the university is going to solve that problem or any one of those problems? W you know, which discipline, biology, is going to solve and save us from climate change? Or is it chemistry or uh, physics, maybe, geology? Which one of those has got it all? Which, which one of those has enough in the toolbox to effectively grapple with something so massive, so complex, and so hellishly important. I mean, 
life on the planet itself hangs in the balance, right? Um, well, obviously, the way I'm speaking suggests that it's just ridiculous to ask such a question. Clearly, no single discipline is ever um, going to hold the promise of you know, solving something as massively complex as climate change. It's just going to require us to transgress those disciplinary boundaries and, and start thinking outside the box. And, um, and so that's what happened here, right? <coughs> so why was the war in Sierra Leone so hellish, right? Well, they held a conference on this in 1997 towards the, uh, nearing the end of uh, uh, the, the war. Um, uh, in Dakar, in Senegal, um, and the proceedings were published in this journal, Journal en Afrique et Um And th th this started out with this out, you know, just f right up front, you know, full, complete, you know, rejection of the new barbarism thesis. Um, there's a chapter, uh, in the uh, opening chapter, really, of that special edition. Um, um, you know, that, that's on the new barbarism thesis. Um, and, and frankly, for good reason, because, you know, there's just not a whole lot of, as I say here, conceptual or theoretical leverage. You don't get a lot of explanatory power um, out of a theory, um, and I use theory loosely there, um, that basically posits you are seeing what you're seeing because Africans are savage. Right? Um, it's, you know, Kaplan's work, uh, the article in the book form just, just, the book form just gave him more room to kind of dig deeper into the oldest Western trope stereotypes of of, uh, of savage, barbaric Africa. Right? Um, so uh, scholars from Africa, in particular, right, um, as they convened in this '97 conference in Dakar, <coughs> engaged in, in what I would say is a true multidisciplinary encounter. Right? Um, Having just said, you know, history is not going to save us, and Violet will. Um, history alone will not help us understand Sierra Leone, nor will anthropology alone, nor will psychology or political science. Or it's really going to require multiple. And so, who attended? You know, some of the kind of key people uh, are people like Ibrahim Abdullah, who was an economist, right? And it's um, actually uh, Abdullah is going to be. Um, kind of uh, really important uh, here in a, in a little bit. He's the one that coins it, kind of a, identifies for us the critical concept that we might want to use to try to make sense of, the, of what we're trying to make sense of, which is the hacking off of hands and limbs and raping babies and stuff. Um, he will kind of point the way um, uh, conceptually to some answers to that stuff. Uh, Yusuf Bangura, a political scientist, uh, now in the United States, but um, uh, then in, uh, in Africa, Lansang Gamberi, um, at the time of the war in Sierra Leone, was um, uh, a historian like Kaplan, but a real, uh, uh, no, so I'm sorry, he was a journalist like Kaplan, but um, already writing as a journalist, he was doing far better analysis um, than Kaplan ever dreams of. But then he went on to graduate school and became, uh, did a PhD in history. Um, uh, Cecil Blake uh, from South Africa was a communications scholar. Um, uh, Patrick Moana, a rhetorician. Um, these folks, um, uh, Ismail Rashid, uh, another historian, uh, you, you're kind of seeing what I'm trying to put together here is that what you've got are, you know, uh, what you've got here is an encounter um, from those silos. This is a, 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 a place and a time where those silos became less isolated and insulated from each other and the uh, grain, if you will, from within each started mixing and blending with that of the others. And out of that blending and mixing, uh, taking, you know, some research methodologies maybe from, from political science and uh, communication uh, and uh, maybe some of the f foundational assumptions of economics and some of the um, uh, narrative um, uh, tools of history, uh, pulling these things together. Remember I said earlier, I kinda, the outcome is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, what they were able to do collectively that, that I don't think any of them would have done, been able to do individually, <coughs> was to um, begin explaining the truly or seemingly uh, inexplicable, right? That is, why was this war so hellish? 
And what they started to uh, look at, uh, the, the core concept, um, we've kind of, as academicians, kind of seized on the English version, or the, actually the German version, um, the Lumpen. Um, but at the conference, um, they were um, invoking the, uh, the, the Creole um, language of Sierra Leone, the kind of this, this um, kind of um, pidgin language, this kind of mixture language um, that grows up between English and, and uh, indigenous mother tongues that were, were pre-existing. And, and, and in that um, Creole is uh, this uh, concept or this term, rare manden. Uh, which refers to, you know, um, if you were um, Sierra Leonean and you, uh, you, you expressed um, uh, the term or you spoke the term Rari Mandem, you were almost certainly going to have this look on your face of utter disgust or perhaps pity. Um, and you would be referring to um, young, very poor, um, off the grid, deeply or, 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 or you know, radically disconnected and isolated from, from society, from their families even. Um, they're engaging all day long in, in you know, kind of mostly petty criminal stuff, uh, gambling, drugs, um, theft, maybe um, some violence. Um, these are um, people, these are young people that, um, you know, are being left behind, we might say, in, in our contexts, right? Um, falling through the cracks, right? Um, they are perhaps uh, Sierra Leone's forsaken um, population people. Um, so they, though they were um, employing the, 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 the um, concept as it's articulated in the in the in in that space Rarimandam, it was instantly recognized um socio demographically socioeconomically as a as a marxist uh, concept the lumpen proletariat <coughs> and so um i perhaps for reasons of marketing maybe um they began to talk about the lumpen rather than continuing to you know always insist on Rarimandam. Um, because they really are conceptually, definitionally very, very similar. Um, Marx, if you know, right, um, spoke of classes in society. In particular, there were basically two classes uh, in conflict in modern capitalist society. There's the proletariat um, and the, the, the bourgeoisie. There is the, you know, the, the latter are those who own the means of production. They own the factories and things. And then the proletariat is the class of workers that um, sell their labor to uh, the, the, the bourgeoisie. So the two classes. But you know, Marx understood that that didn't capture everybody. And so in some writings, he would talk about you know, other elements of society that didn't neatly fit into the dominant paradigm of, of uh, class conflict between uh, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. He specifically spoke about the lumpen proletariat. And these were the people, just as I've described in the Sierra Leonean context, these are often young, but sometimes, you know, they could be aged. But for the most part, these were, you know, um, in, in, in modern or just emerging industrial society in Europe's um, context, people that were, again, kind of just falling through the cracks. Indust the industrial revolution and industrialization was you know, a, sure, attended uh, with um, all the problems of rapid urbanization, you know, um, uh, public health and uh, infrastructure and, and um, pollution and sanitation. I mean, there are real, you know, kind of chronic um, unpleasantries associated with the Industrial Revolution and, and its accompanied uh, rapid urbanization, but, but it's also a time in which great wealth is being generated. Um, and, you know, yes, their lives may be, as Mark said, you know, rather, rather miserable, the, the, the working class. Um, they were still, um, you know, kind of carrying around a hell of a lot more cash than they'd ever had before, um, because in some sense, they were just now living in the cash economy. 
uh, having exited the rural sector for urban industrial options. Um, and then there were those who weren't in at all uh, that, that fundamental conflict. They, they weren't a part of the fundamental game. Marx says that that class conflict is the driving engine of, of history. But the lumpen proletariat, they're not even involved, right? They're just, they're just so off the grid. They, have, they contribute nothing. They are given nothing. Um, and the uh, explanation that will be forged for the inexplicable, seemingly inexplicable nature of horrific violence in Sierra Leone will, will stem from this class or grouping of, of, of uh, people that um, lived lives of, of great desperation on a daily basis. So we're talking about, right, um, socially uprooted. They're just not connected. They're not connected to family, to local communities, to the nation for sure. Um, <coughs> they have no uh, grounding, no bearings, right? They are dispossessed in the sense they've, they've often, you know, lost contact with family and uh, friends from earlier years, um, uh, degraded individuals in the sense that, you know, they, they uh, you know, left education very early. So they have, you know, very poor uh, levels of uh, education, very you know, high levels of illiteracy, and and all of the limitations that 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 um, brings to a person, right? um, as I've already been kind of hinting at, and very poor, frayed, if not often quite downright hostile uh, relationships with um, you know workers in society, their own families, community life. Um, they're out there just living this, you know kind of uh, sex and drugs and rock and roll kind of kind of thing, but, but not in a way that we could say they were enjoying, right? Um, sex and drugs and rock and roll is kind of the, you know, 60s, 70s hippies kind of thing, right? Um, they may be, you know, doing a lot of sex and drugs and, and uh, you know, may not be rock and roll in the background, but, um, but don't for a minute confuse their lifestyle as one that was pleasing to them. Um, Quite the opposite. It was a life of daily humiliations um, and shames um, that were um, the result of you know being so I being in such intimate um, proximity um, to the the nation's wealthiest people. Right. Um, uh, it's often said that you know. Uh, Political systems in, in Africa can be character, can, or sometimes referred to as kind of big man politics games, right? There's, it's run by a big strong man who becomes incredibly wealthy, um, enriches himself at the public trough, and then shares that with you know his clients and so on down the patron client network. Um, when you're in that network, particularly, pardon me, at the top, you become very, 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 very wealthy. Particularly given what what Sierra Leone has buried in the ground, um, and so I want us to kind of just kind of imagine right what it feels like, what it means for these rare mandem who essentially live these aimless, directionless you know lives of of barely surviving, right? Um, no family, no community, no neighborhood, no nation, no, you know, no, they're just off the grid, right? Um, except they have each other, their they're, they're, they're fellow lumpen, their fellow uh, raurimandam. Um, seeing every day um, right next to them is the big caravans of you know, hundred thousand dollar four by fours that are, you know, escorting the, um, you know, the minister of mines around the country, and and I've seen this countless times in so many, so many African countries. Um, it's not enough for the minister to head out to wherever he's got his meeting, but it, for some reason, always requires a whole bloody caravan of these, you know, hundred thousand dollar vehicles, big black. Four by fours, you know, suburbans and what have you, and um, Range Rovers, and um, just a long line of them, escorted in front and side and back by police cars and 
um, motorcycles and I mean it's just a, a life of unimaginable luxury and, and prestige and status and then you've got these rare mundane that are in some respects being driven over by that caravan of, of power privilege and prestige and when you live that life and you live it over a long period you know your whole of your youth um, you can start to understand how uh, they internalize feelings of shame and humiliation when they compare themselves, as people are wont to do, with the better lot of those next to them. Um, and so in this context of, you know, deep humiliations and shames that are inflicted on, on this um, rootless, con you know, disconnected, already predisposed towards violence, um, pour on the you know, um, gasoline uh, to an already simmering fire uh, in the form of the revolutionary United Front who uh, enters the scene, has this really interesting, compelling, convincing marketing tr um, propaganda piece called the, the, you know, the Manifesto of the Revolutionary United Front, Why We Fight. And it is this eloquent, uh, well, fairly eloquent, but but certainly one. Uh, it was a manifesto. It was a, it was an argument that people would have, you know, these these Rari would have would have heard, would have it, it would have spoken to them, right? It was talking about finally bringing justice to the people of Sierra Leone, uh, who have been denied rights of political participation. It was basically not basically. It was it was a one party state, right? So they had no political freedom, they had no economic freedom, they had, they had nothing, right? Um, and so you've got this charismatic leader of the RUF, a guy named Fodisenko, who's, you know, pounding away this message of we're going to throw over the people that have been sticking it to the, to the Rara and them, to us, for all these years, and we're going to take what is ours. And you can imagine that that might appeal to these wholly disaffected, disconnected, uprooted uh, um, population of, of, of unemployed and unemployable youth with no prospects for, other, for anything other than continued lives of shame and humiliation. Seize them or recruit them, uh, give them lots of drugs and alcohol and uh, give them some guns and give them uh, political education on you know, why we're going to live in the bush and fight in and overthrow the capital. You've got a recipe for not just civil war, but given the conditions under which the Rari Mandem had existed, A, they were so easily tapped into, and B, they're going to take that history of shame and daily shames and humiliations, and they're going to do something with those. Right? Uh, it is it's not going to go well for those who get in their way. Uh, they are fed this ideology of uh, a future that will be free from the exclusion that, that is all they've known, right? And, and with this, right, you add this kind of psychology to um, the transformation of the Rare Mandem from city urban ro rootless dwellers to initiates into an armed rebel faction in the bush um, getting training getting political education um, indoctrination um, you have to appreciate the psychological dimension the way in which these young men were having their minds kind of uh, washed in some sense. Right? Um, and so what you see in that horrific violence, uh, following from all that these scholars had been able to kind of pull together is a, is a description of who was doing the violence and the, um, the kind of historical experiences, the lived experiences of those people that were carrying those axes and hatchets and chopping off people's hands and feet. Um, you can appreciate this 
this process of reversing the roles that were being played in society. They had been the pissed on. They had been the ones who had fallen through the cracks and didn't matter in any way. They had been Sierra Leone and the world's truly forsaken uh, population. Um, they weren't even worth uh, trying to help because, you know, they were too far gone. Switch that over and, you know, by giving them guns and a political education and an ideology to follow that fires them up, give them drugs and and give them promises of wealth when they finally take over from the big men that have been just torturing us and you know running this country you know as their own personal possession uh, you've got a recipe not just for for civil war but for something that will be just ghastly in its brutality and all of a sudden right this was something I could work with this this was not, you know, Sierra Leone looks like it looks in conflict because Africans are savages. And I'm sorry, that's just not a compelling explanation. And, and Kaplan should, you know, do what he's never done, which is apologize for that crap he wrote. This was rich. This was, sure, Kaplan's theory was eloquent in the sense that it was very simple to understand, right? Too many people from a place that's always been like this will give you the results that you're seeing. Well, okay, that's simple and elegant, but it's not very persuasive, it's not very illuminating. What these scholars who had dared to, to transgress the boundaries of their history or economics or political science or you know, whatever, disciplines, faculties, they left those silos and, and forged together not just ideas, but ways of uh, thinking and ways of investigating new methods and methodologies will be developed that will help us explain the inexplicable violence of Liberia and Sierra Leone. Okay, so this is the end of part one. I'm going to take a break. It's now close to 3 a.m., so I'll finish the rest up tomorrow. Cheers. <laughs>